I'm really excited about business, honestly, more so than I am about content yeah. this year, at least. I don't know that like that sparks something in my brain when I think about, oh, we're trying to build, you know, we're kind of, I know like, uh, you know, podcasts are such a hot commodity right now and it's only going to increase in the next two, three years. So we want to build our own podcast network. And so we like, you know, we hired this great producer. And so now we've got a great team, me, Noel and, and Kyle and Luke and our editors. And so we're building like an in-house media team and it's, it's, that's really fulfilling. Now we're looking for new space. We're going to build out new sets for other people. And like that really, for some reason makes me pumped. Yeah. And now we got this mug business. I was hoping killing you'd say it. That. We fucking did seventy thousand dollars worth of mugs in the past two weeks. It's fucking insane. What is up, everyone? This is episode number two, and today we are talking the business of Cody Co. Now, before we jump in, I want to give you some quick background on Cody. So, in my opinion, Cody really is the modern day Renaissance man. I mean, this guy is good at every single thing he does. He actually started out as a computer science major at Duke. There, Cody built the app, I'd cap that, which put random captions on photos. It hit number one on the app store and he sold it shortly after. Now that was back in 2012. Since then, he's become a podcaster. Him and Noel Miller's TMG podcast is the number seven comedy podcast. He's a YouTuber. His channel has over 5 million subs and he's closing in on a billion views. He's done live shows. Him and Noel did a 70 city tour and he's become a rapper. The TMG Spotify has over 200 million streams. I mean, seriously, whatever he does, he's really, really good at it. I wanted to give you that background because in this conversation, we talk about what Cody wants to do next from launching a podcast network to creating his own standalone products to getting into angel investing. Now, enough from me. Let's get back into the episode was good thanks what's happening on, man? dude thanks for having me on man i appreciate it how are you doing i'm good i'm stoked to chat with you um i gotta say i'm a i'm a fan of your twitter i love your twitter i mean i like what you do obviously like yeah and uh you know we, we uh you put me in the you got me in a music what was that festival in Dallas or something like that? I, I was scared you were going to bring that up. I was scared. <laughs> no, that was fun. I was telling uh, the producers before, I was like, dude, this one thing I want to bring up, but I still feel bad about that moment I brought you to the Juice World Festival. <laughs> that was fun. What do you mean? I mean, it I mean, was, it was big, like, I had to kind show. of, yeah, it was a shit show. And it was probably the most like pathetic music event <laughs> that I've ever been to. It was in a stadium. And there was like, what, that seats like 20,000 people or something like that? Correct. And there was probably like 500 people on the floor, like uh, packed around the stage. Correct. But we were up in the box and we had VIP treatment and we just got to watch the show from up there. It was hilarious. Yeah. But what Cody's not telling you is I convinced him to come down because I said, you're going to, we're going to do a little juice world thing. It'll be a VIP. (laughs) It'll be the best thing ever. And then when we got there, I quickly found out that like I was going to have to do everything. And for some reason, I wore the shortest shorts I've ever worn. I don't know what I was thinking that day. While you were in the booth and we were trying to like feed Cody drinks to keep him like cool, Ian in his brand mode was literally sweating bullets. And I was trying to talk my way backstage because our credentials didn't work anymore. But I needed Cody and Juice to like meet each other. Because like when you're trying to get talent to come to an event, it's important you actually fulfill on your promises. I just remember talking to this bouncer and I just like looked like the biggest loser ever. So I just had these like (laughs) short shorts on. But the minute I said, this is the funny part, I go, Cody Coe's here to meet him. And he goes, oh, Cody Coe. And it was one of those moments. And this is a nice transition where like everybody knows you from different things. You're a podcaster. You're a rapper. You're a (laughs) YouTuber. It's just funny. Can I just interrupt real quick? Because it's funny, like that moment in the Dallas place was was it was awkward because it's like it's you get your ego checked like you know we're there we get flown in we're going to this we get the vip treatment with the box and everything and we're like we feel like i'm feel like a celebrity right i feel like a, a big wig i like you know i'm looking down on all these people crowded around the stage and i'm like i'm up here just sipping my moscow mules or whatever feeling like a you know like a you know big dick and all these people right and yeah. then we go down to meet juice world which i'm like fuck yeah dude i'm i'll, I'll just like you know shoot the shit with juice for a second why not green room sure let's do it and the bouncer's like nah 
I don't know who any of you people are. And you can come in for one second. We could, we came in, we sat beside juice. They took a picture and then we dipped. That was all we got to do with them. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, like, but I mean, like, I don't know what else I expected. He's literally one of the coolest people in the entire world. Like to be a rapper at that level, you're one of the coolest people on earth. So how yeah. do you expect that you're going to get a normal react? Like he's going to fucking know who I am or something like that, you know? Well, we went down. I mean, when you, anytime you work with promoters, everything is totally fine with the promoter until the event happened. And then suddenly it was like, oh yeah, Cody and them can hang out. It's going to be perfect. And I'm like, this is sick. This is our moment. Like Cody's going to think I'm cool. He's going to think SeatGeek's cool. <laughs> Maybe like he'll think me and Juice World have some weird connection we don't have. <laughs> None of those things happened. Yeah, Ian's boy, boys with Juice, man. Yeah. They go way back. It's crazy. Dude, none of those things happened. But what I appreciate... <laughs> And this is not hyping you up is like I said it to, to the team afterwards. I was like, I appreciate it was the, the person that happened to was Cody and Noel just because they were so not douchebags about it. Like it could have been I've dealt with a lot of people and that could have gone really, really south. And we just ended up drinking a lot of beers. Yeah, it was fun. And that was the night. But we had a great time. I appreciate about that about you and that it, you're a creator who kind of doesn't sure you may have felt like you're on your high horse but you didn't come in there with a massive ego being like dude what the fuck you fucked me over i was thinking i was thinking it inside you know i could tell but i just play i'm a good actor i'm just like yeah it's all good man it's yeah. all good I'm inside i'm like dude i'm never doing anything with seat geek ever again <laughs> no, I'm <kidding. laughs> no i'm kidding it was it was a great time and i actually it was a cool cool to meet juice world you know even though it was for five seconds but it was cool just to be next to him and just see that type of because that's a whole another echelon of like cool lifestyle crate like they walked in immediately everyone's smoking blunts inside that green room but he walked in and it's just like dudes you know just getting fucked up and then he goes and does a show for like 10 15 minutes i imagine he got paid like so much money for that right. and then they left so how many jobs do you have right now because i made a list <laughs> There's a, you do a lot of things i um I made a list too at the end of the year just to like track my progress. I made like a spreadsheet. Is that something you do regularly? 2000, let's see. 2018 is when things like really started to pick up for me. That Probably was like a podcast. So you the TMG podcast is kind of picking up storm or is that Yeah, just traction with everything. Like everything was kind of feeding into each other and I felt really creative and motivated and then 2019 was the same thing but we toured like pretty much that whole year. Yep. And then, and then, so that's when I really started to like, uh, you know, when things really started working 2018, that's when I started like really making money and feeling like I kind of, you know, was hitting my stride creatively and all this stuff. And so, and then with this last year, it was kind of like, so 2019 was like the year 2019, I guess was, I made a ton of money. And then 2020 from, uh, touring? I, from, from just from like the touring podcast the pod and, Cause it's you like when everything like started different collectively. Ways. Yeah. It's like when now all the revenue streams started to kind of pick up. And so it was a great year for me at the end of the year. I could just be like, Holy fuck compared to 2018. This is, this is incredible. Right. And then 2020 happened and it was similar, but I didn't know if I had, you know, it was a weird year. I, we couldn't tour right. and, and I wasn't, you know, things, you know, I'm not getting as many views as I did, as I did and stuff like that. And I didn't realize like how good 2019 was. So I wanted to track things and see how much I declined or, if I increased, you know, like numbers wise, numbers wise. Yeah. All the different avenues you attack, you seem to do them well. And I don't understand how that's possible. There's not very many creators you can do. Let's say you're really good at YouTube and then maybe you launch a podcast and then you're just like, wow, this person's really talented. There's not many people who can do that and then do live shows. Cause like a live show is a whole different animal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think first of all, I'm not good at live shows yet. Like, but that's the thing is, is I think that's why I can do that is I pride myself on respecting whatever medium I'm trying. Like a lot of people will make it on YouTube from vlogging and then all of a sudden they think they're God's gift to the earth and they can do anything. And so they yeah. hop into acting and they hop into music and then they get made fun of and they fail. And it's like, well, yeah, because you didn't, you don't respect people that spend their entire lives dedicating everything they do to, to make it in music. Like, who are you to just hop into that and be like, oh, I'm going to get a good producer and I'm just going to succeed. It's like, you know, you have to sit down. You have to you have to just crank it out. You have to think about it a lot. So like a lot of like critical thinking, what's going to make this work versus this, you know, and and 
again, I don't have it figured out, but I'm saying like, I, I think that I am good at respecting that process. It's like sitting down. I'm not going to be good at doing a podcast right away, but now I've put in infinite hours. So I'm decent, you know? Right. Right. And so but, when you look at that spreadsheet that you have, where you have the different things you do, do you, and you say, okay, my views are down. Does that bum you out? Or is that a challenge? Like, how do you view now 2020 retrospectively? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. It's kind of a weird, it's a weird time for me in my, uh, historically for me, it would be like, that's a, that's a, that's motivating. It's like, let's right. figure out what's not working. Let's um, like, there was this one moment where I looked at our Patreon and we had totally plateaued for like four months. It was like, uh, you know, ever since we started our Patreon, Patreon month by month, the numbers were going up. And you started Patreon, like to back up, you were one of the earliest people to get on the membership kind of creator bandwagon. Like when you, when you and Noel launched Patreon, that was when for the podcast? Uh, uh, 2017? No, 2018, I think. Yeah. I mean, that was an early, you were an early mover on, and that was so you could get the money to quit your job or for Noel to quit his job. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So it's yeah, like, it was, okay, we can gear, if we get this many percentage of people to opt into our Patreon, we're going to be like, we have some financial security. Yeah, exactly. It's like right away we have money to play with in terms of buying gear and, right. um, you know, like warrants this time that we're spending to, to, and it's kind of proof of concept a little bit as, as well. It was like, let's see how many people can, well, are willing to pay right off the jump. And that was really motivating in showing us, oh, people really want this show. So let's like put a lot of effort into it. Right. And so then the um, numbers start plateauing. Yeah. So we went on tour and we stopped, you know, we stopped like really the podcast kind of bu like bumped down a little bit in terms of priorities because we were so focused on the live show and we were like, we still want to keep the show going, obviously. But we weren't like putting a ton of energy into it and we could feel it and the numbers started plateauing. And so we said, and we weren't like really delivering on our promises on Patreon and that was part of it too. And so, you know, we looked at it and we said, uh, what's going to, what's going to make this grow again? It's like, we really have to deliver to the Patreon people. So we started doing one bonus episode every week. And now we've been doing that for almost a year. And that, that was, you know, that was really motivating, uh, looking at the plateau and figuring out what to do, how to conquer that. And mm -hmm. so the numbers started growing again and now it's plateaued again. And it, I'm not as motivated. I mean, I am motivated, but it's just a weird time where I'm getting a little bit older and my focuses aren't entirely on work anymore. And like, how can I grow and in whatever right. I'm doing, you know what I'm saying? Right. I totally get the energy thing. I think we are the same age and I don't do nearly as many of things that you do. And for me, it's, it's hard to motivate yourself to grind. Like I did in my twenties where I literally work seven days a week. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Why it, it's weird. And, and you so care now about other shit. Like you, yeah. I have a wife and I'm like, I would like to spend time with my wife. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Whereas before, like you're saying mid, mid twenties, which feels like it was yesterday. It felt like no matter what happened, that was, uh, you know, I could use that no matter what happened in terms of YouTube or whatever. It was like, I always wanted more. I wanted to grow. I wanted to build. I felt like I had that Mr. Beast mentality where he's like, I'm going to succeed no matter what. I'm going right. to do as many things as I can. But it's slowed down in my brain now. Like, you know, I, I don't know. I just feel like I'm not got as, a house. like I'm not as hungry. Yeah, I got a house, and I'm, and I'm. It's weird. I'm like not as hungry, and that's kind of affecting me a little bit. I feel like I should be. I'm like, there's no reason why I shouldn't be as hungry as I was. Like, if I want to build something truly great, it's like I still yeah. got to go. But it, it takes a little bit of like reminding myself now. Whereas before, it was like just uh, autopilot. No matter what, I was going 100. percent do you feel like I have this where if you have to tell yourself you need to care more that that should say something about the whole, like you could get real meta with it. Whereas like, if you have to remind yourself to be hungry, does that mean you aren't hungry? Yeah, no, that's true. It's like in your gut, it's like, should I really be doing this? Yeah. Maybe I'm not as into it as I was before. So then when you look now at 2021, what are you excited about? Or what are you thinking about? I'm excited. I'm, I'm really excited. Um, about business, honestly, more so than I am about content yeah. this year, at least. I don't know that like that sparks something in my brain when I think about, oh, we're trying to build, you know, we're kind of, I know like, uh, you know, podcasts are such a hot commodity right now and it's only going to increase in the next two, three years. So we want to build our own podcast network. And so we like, you know, we hired this great producer. And so now we've got a great team, me, Noel, and, 
and Kyle and Luke and our editors. And so we're building like an in-house media team and it's, it's, that's really fulfilling. Now we're looking for new space. We're going to build out new sets for other people. And like that really, for some reason makes me pumped. Yeah. And now we got this mug business. I was hoping killing you'd say it. That. We fucking did seventy thousand dollars worth of mugs in the past two weeks. Fucking insane. The wide mugs. Cause it was just a st- stupid idea. It was it, all based on the phrase "mean mugging." Right. Mean mugs. We were like, "Oh my god, that'd be so funny if these mugs." If we had literal mugs that were mean, right? They said "fuck off," and like they were used. They used to be way worse. Like one of them said "kill yourself" or something like that. Like, <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it was bad. But they were mean. That's what it was supposed to be. It was like it was supposed to be shocking, and then we it kind of we iterated on it. And it kind of just became funny mugs, right? And we hit something. I don't know. It's working really well. And so now I'm hiring a team to handle that as well. So like we want to kind of grow that business and uh, explore other product cues, product skews, and stuff like that. Like I'm sure we could sell those things to Urban Outfitters and you know, oh, yeah. stores like in that same vein. So that's that's also really inspiring. Can I get um, meta with you on that as someone? Yeah. Do you think that goes back to like back in college when you built that app? Like to me, that reminds me of when you built like reading about you building that app at yeah. Duke. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's just because uh, like people don't a, know for people a testament. So don't know, and I think yeah, everyone knows who's listening to this podcast. This was like when Greg on on my team told me that he's like, yeah, Cody used to be a software engineer. I was like, now it all makes sense. Yeah. But it, it hit me and I was like, okay, that's how he's, att- he's, he's attacking these things almost like in some ways, like a software engineer where it's like, I got to learn it. Once I learn it, if I practice hard enough, I'll get good at the next thing. I, um, I think it's a testament to how not actually smart I am that I love really simple ideas that you just get right away. Right. Like automatic captions on pictures at that point time it was like oh my god like people pick up the app and they use it for five seconds and they understood it right it's the same thing with the mugs people go to the website and they go oh these are great it doesn't take longer than that to figure out what it is what it, what it's for what the intention is and yep. the mugs feel exactly the same as the as i'd cap that like it gives right. me the same feeling yep and I, I love that i mean like that's those are the favorite those are my favorite like songs i make when i think of a funny song concept that's simple i can explain it in one sentence and it's just i don't know why i i you know i'm a i'm a i'm a hoe for ideas like that <laughs> yeah got it Makes yeah sense yeah exactly and Mr. then Beast somebody burger looks, oh yeah. cool i know exactly what that is that's <laughs> a I, that's a burger made out of mr beast <laughs> yeah it is like literally mr beast flesh and blood <laughs> in a burger now he's doing i think finger on the app too is like the it's another one. Keep your finger on the fucking app and win money. Yeah. Just hold it there for as long as you can. Boom. Yeah, that's because you guys get marketing. But like everyone on the outside of my life is like, oh, you work with YouTubers? Like, don't those people just, you know, just buy Ferraris, chill in mansions and not actually work? And I was like, sure, there's a percentage of them that do do that. They don't usually last very long. But the majority yeah. of them are like the hardest working people I've ever met. Yeah. Yeah. But they're really good marketers, right? Like you're an entrepreneur at the core because every day you're distributing your message to millions of people. And you, how are you going to do that is a science, but also how can you build businesses off it is like this next stage in creator where you have the Mr. Beast Burger, yeah. you're launching the mugs, Emma Chamberlain launched her coffee. And like then she's, these... got a, she's got a skin skincare thing now too. Yeah. So when's Cody's skincare line? You got great well, skin. It's coming, brother. It's coming. As you can see, it's just called sweating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be a bottle, just a bottle of my sweat <laughs> that you can wear. <laughs> that's another thing. That's that's one of my focuses for 2021. And that's why I am not hesitant to call myself a YouTuber because no matter what I'm doing, everything goes better when YouTube is going well. That's yeah. the thing. Everything ties back to YouTube. But I want to work on something that's independent of that. Because you don't want to get in a world where you feel like you have to do YouTube to support everything else. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of how it has been for the past like three years. Um, now we're starting to see with our music, I get a lot of tweets, people of people being like, I had no idea that you were in tiny meat gang. I listen to you all the time on Spotify and I just saw the music video and I watch you on YouTube. And now I didn't realize like you guys were the same people. Yeah. 
which is cool. And I kind of want that same thing to happen with, with, um, with mugs is like, you know, grow that brand as its own thing. So people just see it in urban outfitters, they see it elsewhere and they don't really realize. And of course I'm going to promote it, help drive sales, obviously, but, but it's its own living, alone. breathing thing. Right. And I want to do that also. Um, I've started investing thanks to you. That's one of the things I, you know, I'm, I uh, am very thankful to you for, as you introduced me to someone, I invested in them and now I've invested in a couple companies. And so I kind of been thinking about now starting like a small fund with my friend, Yep. Um, I have and that, one that's you. also a thing. I, something I want to have be its own living, breathing thing that right. really inspires me too. Right. Me too. To me, it's like a, I never went to business school. And so I feel like there's a certain part missing in my life where like, I want to see other businesses, yeah. but I can bring value to them where I can, there's like a two way conversation there where I can bring value, just like not to the same extent you can, but you can help a lot of these startups right now, they're struggling with distribution. Whereas you have the distribution, but you want to then add products to it, right? Whether it's mugs. Yeah. Whether it's other things. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. And it's also, it's like, I can invest money. I don't have to invest my time. Yeah. I can help the company, but and I'll, now I'm, I'm invested in its success and it feels like I'm part of this startup, even though I'm not, but right. it's, like that's super fulfilling for some reason. Do you think more of these conversations happen are going to come with deliverables of like Cody's investing, but we're also, he's going to be promoting us in these ways. Yeah. I think that's the, the, the investing part people have figured out. I don't know if people have totally figured out the back end of that equation. I've worked with you. I know the value of Cody Co's promotion. If you're putting a startup in your ads, that's ad money you're not getting if, unless they're giving it to you. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that, so that's kind of funny that you brought that up. It was the first company that I invested in that was totally figured out and it was super easy. They doubled uh, my equity if I agreed to promote. It didn't double it. They matched half if I agreed to promote and they're going to pay me royalties on top of everything I sell. Right. And then that's with another clean. one, it's more of an earlier stage startup that, and this one works with athletes. I work with a ton of people. And the next one uh, was something that, you know, a company that is is earlier stage, I guess. And and that was something that we had to discuss with them and figure out. And that wasn't as like ironed, ironed out. And so that is kind of a, kind of a, like a weird thing, awkward thing. It's like, yeah, I'm going to promote you, but also I, you're, you're going to, you're going to be using up real estate that I could be getting paid a ton of money for. Right. You're really going big. You have the, what is that podcast network about? Is it this is it similar type to what you're doing now? Like, how are you finding the creators? Cause I've seen a lot of creators, start down this path and then they get kind of hung up with the idea of signing other talent yeah. because that's a level of, they don't want to get into the business of dealing with other talent because yeah. not, that's not always easy. Yeah. And I don't know. We're still, that's, that's where we are basically. <laughs> and so I hope that we figure it out, but we've had a couple meetings and what we don't want to become is these networks that we met with at the very beginning of our podcast where they sat us down and they said, okay, what are your ideas? And we're like, we don't have, we just, we're good at what we do. Just let us go and shoot the shit and we'll riff for an hour. And so that's what, what our show is, wants to be. And they're like, yeah, but we need like segments and we need a concept and we need a one pager and you got to write all this shit down and bring it to us. And it has to be like a formulated concrete show before you even start. And we're like, this is not how we do shit. We hop on, we figure out what's, what's working, what's not. And then we build, we iterate from there. That's how we built the show from the ground up. And luckily we didn't sign with one of these agencies because now we own the entire show and right. the IP and we can build, we can bootstrap our own network with our own money and we own hundred percent of it. But now we're in that same position where we're looking for other people and we're meeting with them and they're like, yeah, we're just going to shoot the shit for an hour. And we're like, oh, I don't, I can't, I need some proof that this is going to be good. Right. So now we're becoming those shitty. Well, you had networks. a track record before that those networks approached you. Like, so I don't know anything about this world. So walk me through that, that pitch. What value is a network providing? Like, is it ad sales support? Is it for money up front production, ad sales? Like for, for the, do they the, give you upfront money? Sometimes they'll give you a minimum guarantee. Yep. If you're big. So if you're a creator, the benefit for you is you sign with one of these companies and you walk in every Wednesday, they have a set ready. They have a producer sitting there. You plop down there's a TV yep. right there. You read the ads off the TV. You do your segments that they give you. You know, they, ha they have some creative working that's writing for the show, whatever. And then you walk out 
and they edit and they cut highlight clips and they do everything for you. Got it. That's all something that we had to do at the beginning ourselves. And now we have, we've since hired people to do it for us. Um, but that's the benefit for some. So the thing is, is that, yeah, like we've met with people that have a good track record on YouTube, but for like, this is such a unique medium. It's like, I don't know, being funny in a 10 minute video does not prove that you can be funny in 60, 60 minutes. Right. It's a whole different right. animal. Right. Or maybe it does. I don't know. But that's what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's a tough thing. Right. And so I think what we maybe do to start is have a couple spinoff shows where it's each of us and someone else or something like that. Right. And that's kind of what um, other networks are doing. It seems like, but I don't know where well, that's where we are right now. And, but it's fun to explore. Like I'm really excited. Yeah. Who's your partner? Like, is that, is that you and Noel talking about what do we want to do next? We see yeah. how much money Spotify is dumping all over the place. And yeah. we're just like, well, we're, we should be getting some of this money and how do we set ourselves up? But also, cause the, the tough part about being a creator and this is actually, I thought of something smart to say is like, you guys are so <laughs> beholden to like working, like your mugs is an example of you. If, if it's living by itself, you don't have to constantly be doing YouTube videos and different things to bring in money, right? Yeah. You are then getting money from the mugs and it's like an yeah. independent self-fulfilling entity. Uh-huh. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And um, I mean, I, th I also think, you know, what's weird for a creator is that, um, and this is, this is something that really impresses me about Mr. Beast is that the way this industry is set up and Hollywood is set up is that when you prove that you can make money from your artistry then you're a creative and everything business-wise is handled for you right by your manager and your agent and you know your business manager and all the people that work for you they're the ones that handle all the outside stuff so then you kind of just you know it you kind of become conditioned to i'm the guy that puts out stuff and then other people try to make money for me based off that thing mm -hmm. so when we so growing a business like a podcast network is is a little bit was a little bit more difficult for me you know mentally to get my head around because it's like i don't know how to hire yeah i don't know where to even start to find a production assistant luckily we've just we've we've done it but it like it was that was a hard hurdle for me mentally because it's like i'm i'm not the businessman my business people are the businessmen right but it's I you know so that part of me wasn't getting satisfied. Mm -hmm. So when we wanted our producer, we said like, how can we you know we want a show that looks like, uh you know all these tier one podcasts look right, multiple camera angles and these beautiful sets. Oh, we don't know where the fuck to. I was watching you in like the living that. room with Jason Nash, and it was it was it was you and Jason. It was just like you, your table, surfboard behind you, but it was just like a. It was a janky setup, but it, it worked. It was funny. It was hilarious. Yeah. And I think yeah, it, yeah. it makes you endearing to some extent, though. You have to yeah, yeah. I mean, that. yeah. I think that, um, yeah, any podcast that starts from scratch, is that's where they start, in the living room. Right. The living room behind you. But even now, it's like, like yeah, we have, our show looks good. and uh, But, like, we just keep going through these phases where we're like, hey, we want it to look better. How do we do that, you know? Whereas I feel like Logan Paul, for some reason, sat down and was like, I want a podcast. And all of a sudden, next day, yeah. he's got this like <laughs> yeah, I fucking set and nine producers and 67 camera angles and a, and a production or like a, you know, like a master a fucking control room where there's nine guys sitting there changing camera angles and they have highlight clips and all this shit. And it's like, how do we get there? How do how is this happening? Right. I know. I saw the exact thing. I was like, what the fuck? Word? So Logan Paul, like overnight was like, yep, I'm gonna do a podcast. And it just came out in fucking nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> and it was good. I thought the interview is pretty good. Like he yeah. just got it, made it happen. So if you're, if you're an up and coming creator, do you recommend kind of your path where it's tougher, but now you actually have the business chops. Whereas there's a lot of people who sign with the big agencies and like, you just, you, you sit down at a table. I'm sure you've done it. And there's like 15 fucking people. And like, it's like, I'm the head of books. I'm the head of movies. Yes. Do you, do you recommend kind of finding your own thing or do you think for some creators the more traditional i don't want to fucking deal with any business stuff i, I don't my know. ip and sell it everywhere it totally depends who yeah. you are and where you are in your career like for someone like emma yeah her 
you know, her agent fucking, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying she doesn't have any business chops, but she's, she's young and she's killing it. Killing and it. her, you know, her team around her are doing an incredible job. She got great. Finding team. business ideas and, and, you know, it's really hard to know. negotiate with really hard to negotiate with. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In a good <laughs> way. Imagine. In a good way. I can't even imagine. Well, but I'm saying, you know, manager is very tough too. Yeah. But I mean, for her, she can walk into UTA and be like, uh, or wherever she's repped, I forget, but, and be like, I want to do coffee. And they're like, cool. We know you're going to sell. We got the best people on the job right now doing it. Right. But for me, it's like, I walk in there, I want to do coffee. And they're like, ah, who are you? Yeah. Just what kidding. about a beer? That's more your thing or we'll figure it out. But that's hard because of these reasons and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, so how do you do the mugs? You just were like, I'm fucking doing mugs and I'm going to figure out someone who's going to make my mugs. And I'm going to find they're a all designer. Through, they're all through. It's all drop shipped right now. It's all through a print on demand company that handles all of it, which we're paying a huge premium for. But now, now we have the money to hire someone to figure out inventory and order right. mugs from China and all that shit. So yes, I think that if you, it's a slower process when you deal with everything yourself. But now I know in the future, if I want to build another show from the ground up, like I know exactly what it's going to take, what gear it takes, what I could produce a great podcast right now for, for yeah. someone else, probably. Yeah. But I know exactly what it takes. And that's only from building it from the ground up. Yeah. No, but it took a, five years or four years or whatever it's been. Yeah. But you know how to, it's crazy when you think about, I hate to use the word toolkit because I feel like I'm a growth hacker whenever I say it, but like yeah. you have a lot of tools in your toolkit. Like you've done music, you make beats, you've been an actor, like you've seen so many different things. Like, is there any creative world next where you're just like, this is what I want to conquer next? Or is it now it's business and like, I feel good about all my creative outlets. Like, are you going to become a painter? <laughs> no, that's something I'll never fucking do. <laughs> I, I don't know. I actually, I don't want to say that. I don't want to say I'll never do it because I saw a TikTok of some chick painting with a mop. Like you put a giant canvas on the floor and then just dipped a mop and paint and like stabbed the middle and went like this. And then it's like the next scene was it hanging in a $10 million mansion. She's like, yeah. my client was happy with this one. I'm like, I could fucking do that. I mean, I couldn't. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying about respecting the medium is like, it's probably way harder than it looks. Right. Do you ever want to get into more scripted stuff or you're just, yeah. Yeah. I want something like, you know, now when I look back at that's cringe, like people are still quoting it. People still, you know, uh, regurgitate memes from that's cringe. And it was like, that was like a series that people really resonated with and it's going to stay with them for a long time. Yeah. And you know, I'm watching friends right now and going through the whole series of friends. Wait, what do you, what do you it's think like, of friends? Cause I get, I people, fucking love it. Thank God. Can I people just it. hop off their fucking friends high horse? I love, it gives me a hug. It's like being yeah. swaddled by yes. love. Yeah. Like just be stupid for a little while and laugh at Joey. Yeah. It's just, it's good, but I it's get corny. I get, but oh, super that's corny. the good thing about it is it's not that corny. No, it's not corny enough. And it's especially not like if... Big Bang Theory corny. It's not like no. classic laugh track sitcom comedy. There's a lot of it that would work without the laugh track. Yeah. And it's still fucking, it's amazing 10 years or 20 years later or whatever, how everything's still funny. Yep. It's not I, dated like I've at watched all. it seven times. I got yeah. my, I'm a big, fr I'm like a probably a friend super fan. Like I've lived next to the, the fake location that they live at in New York. Nice, and nice. I, I go there, like, I don't go there to see it, but I, whenever I'm there, I like make sure to like pay my respects <laughs> to the fake place that friends used to be cast at. And there's Eat always people sandwich there or something fucking... in honor of Joey. Yeah. Joey. So you think you want to so, do some scripted thing related to. Yeah. I mean, everything, the, the life cycle for YouTube content is you come up with an idea, you do it, you get it out right away. Yeah, that's what it is. And so that's what I'm conditioned to now. It's just like pumping out constantly pumping out ideas, come up with something, then you're done with it the next week. And that's what's cool about music is it's more of a longer thing where we sit on and something for months at a time to do that fucks. cycle. Like that cycle fucks with people's heads. Yeah, exactly. Because then you, that's you what I'm saying. You get bigger and bigger hit every shit. every week. And then you stop doing things and you feel like a failure because you're not getting that like constant dopamine from posting. or you just start doing weird shit like shit like i'm gonna go homeless for a like you just start doing, yeah, yeah, you just yeah. start going so yeah. far that you lose touch with even like what is your brand to begin with yeah so, yeah sorry i cut you so off then you look at these franchises where that are really well thought out and you know I, I i would love to work on something one thing for five years you know i look at I watch the shit's creek documentary and i'm like god that was how a great incredible documentary. is that to be involved in something I like cried. that that's living and breathing but you know it's 
growing and you know at the end of it it's like we did something really great that's going to last for a long time that's yeah. really cool yeah i would Seeing love to like do something like that it's i don't know it's you you're drawn to that it's i mean it's the same thing with real bros now it's like we ended the last season i was like god it feels like it's just it feels like we're family now sort of you know we're not quite on set for as long as the right. people on Shit's creek but we filmed three seasons together and it was like now we know all of our characters inside out and it's just it's this thing now we can read the comments and people have been following on from the beginning and right. all the comments are just memes it's just inside jokes that if you were to come and watch an episode without knowing what the show was in season three and read the comments you'd be like what the fuck is this a cult that's why that's when you know your advertising is going to work to any marketers who are listening if a group of people has inside jokes that only that community gets the level of influence and like passion there is unrivaled yeah i would agree with that well i had a different final question but i like to put people kind of on the spot in terms of let's say somebody came to you and they said all right we want you to do a scripted series we're gonna let you have full creative control you can get all the people you want but it has to be on youtube or facebook like, do you care where it is disseminated Ideally, you want as many eyeballs as possible. Right. So, yeah, Netflix would be the dream because they that's the place now. It's its funny how that's like five, like what, five years ago, six years ago, nobody would be like, the number one place my content has to be is Netflix. Yeah. Creators now view Netflix as the place they want to go, which is just an amazing place to sit as a place where like creators want to work with you versus... Yeah okay, I'm going to be put on like this CW that probably yeah. doesn't get Cody Co going too much. I mean, I don't know. You might be a CW guy. I'm not sure. That's my, that's my audience, man. Maybe Bravo. Yeah, a lot of intersection. Or Bravo. Hol yeah. What's uh, the holiday the home, channel? Home channel or whatever. Oh, oh. The uh, Hallmark Lifetime. channel. Hallmark channel. Yeah, Hallmark that channel, seems yep. kind of like your thing. I see. Here's the thing. I think that I, I love Facebook and what they did for the, for real bros and, um, I mean, obviously they like, you know, it was great having it on that platform, but I have so much respect for Jimmy and Christian's writing and what that show became that I really do think if it was on something like Netflix, it would have been like another workaholics. Yeah. And workaholics was, I mean, that's an incredible, incredible show, but really I think real bros is so fucking funny and the people that watch it truly love it. A lot of shows on Netflix were like, like Shit's Creek wasn't big it was like a it, it, it wasn't on netflix originally yeah, it, right yeah it like it almost licensed to netflix and then it suddenly becomes and a then thing it, right yes yeah so one day maybe real bros gets licensed yeah, to netflix and maybe then we'll like see. five years later you're gonna be like i fucking told you so on Ian's yeah, exactly. podcast i said yeah. this was gonna be fucking massive exactly when i'm on conan and i'm yeah, sitting there talking about sitting... my character wade yeah and then conan you guys are gonna be la well is conan really the number one host isn't it like fallon I guess or, Fallon. Or yeah. Conan's more your speed. Maybe I'm, I'm going to hit them guy. all. I'm going to hit them all. Yeah, you're going to do the press circuit. This is you're before gonna... my book comes out. Right. That's right. my I... next thing, writing a novel. Is it actually? <laughs> no, but in the back of my head, I'm like, that'd be cool. I feel like that's, that's like another the... long-term thing that you like work on for a long time and then it drops and you're like, ah, I deserve this moment, you know? Or you do what every creator does and you like have someone ghost write it for you and like, yeah <laughs> four weeks and then come out with it and then buy enough copies that it hits number one on the amazon charts and then you yep. can say oh, yeah. you're a new york bestseller for the rest of your life yeah exactly it's going to be called the uh four hour i don't know orgasm yeah how to become <laughs> uh, how to become the modern day renaissance man in four hours by cody co leonardo <laughs> da leonardo da vinci cody co nailed you're it next <laughs> All right. Well, I'll leave you guys on that one because I'm not going to think of a better ending than that. Um, Cody, really appreciate it, it. It was nice and almost therapeutic to talk through like the business side with you for a little while. That's why I was excited to do this. You know, to that's do what this because every other fucking podcast, podcast called, I do, what is, what is it called? The business talk through side. Business? The business side. Is it really? The business side and then like of Cody Co. All right. That's the episode, folks. If you made it this far, I hope you liked it. I got some feedback from my mother that I should do an outro. Shout out, mom. So here's my outro on the episode. I had three main takeaways. The first is Cody's mindset on how he attacks all the different crafts he does. I think it's 
it's pretty amazing that someone who can be good at YouTube is also a good stand-up comedian, is also a good podcaster, can also get into rap. I mean, he's even a computer science you know, major and developed an app that he sold. There's really, I've never met anyone who's good at so many different things. And to me, that point in the podcast where Cody brings up how he appreciates each different craft he gets into. That when you reach the top echelon of YouTube, it's really easy to say, all right, next week I'm going to become a rapper. And he resisted that urge and he put the time in to actually be good at everything he was going to jump into. He respected that process and he put the hours he needed to in so that he was respecting whatever medium he was jumping into. The second thing is Cody's mindset now that he's reached the heights that he has. Social media stars are this new phenomenon where we really haven't seen that career arc before. We haven't seen what it looks like for someone to, you know, spend eight years producing content like Cody has. And what's interesting to me is now he wants to do things that don't rely on him making content. He wants to start a podcast network for other comedians. He wants to start his own products. He wants to get into investing, investing. He wants to find things that don't require him to produce content. And that's what really gets him going. And that's his spark. The third thing that's really interesting to me is even in the age of YouTube, where he grew up on likes and views, and those were the most important metrics, he still wants to leave that legacy piece. He brought up Friends, he brought up Schitt's Creek. These are iconic shows that don't live on YouTube. They live on Netflix, they live on HBO, they live on you know these big networks that are kind of iconic, but not in the social media world. And it's really interesting to me that he wants to leave his legacy and produce one of those scripted pieces. So those are my three major takeaways from this episode. But I also wanted to call out Shannon, Greg, and Jeremy on the SeatGeek team. I told that, or Cody and I talked about that uh, experience where, the very funny experience where he and Juice World had that interaction. What I didn't say was how much work each of them did to make that entire day possible. It was not an easy day. And I have this memory of Shannon on the team, you know, really busting through the door of all the, uh, of the bouncer to get that Juice World meetup to happen. And so I wanted to make sure to thank them. And last but not least, if you wouldn't mind subscribing and leaving me a review, I would really appreciate it. Um, I've got a lot of great feedback on the podcast and it means a ton when I look into the reviews and see that people are actually liking it. So thank you for your time and I'll see you next episode.